Welcome everyone. So glad that you're here this morning. We appreciate your presence uh, so very much as we worship God today here at the Adairsville Church of Christ. Uh, be sure to get a newsletter from the foyer. There's a lot of information in there that will be helpful to you. Uh, this would also be a good time to silence your cell phones if you haven't done that yet so that we're not disturbed by those during our worship service. Uh, just a few things by way of announcement. First of all, we have several on our sick list. <laughs> Uh, including Sarah Medlock and Steve Hayes, Sonny Parker, Sandy DeRome, Valerie McCoy, and Joy Thacker. Some of those are here. We're grateful. Some are not, but we want to keep all those in our prayers. Uh, also, Jackie Owen's sister, Bonnie Stevens, will have cancer surgery tomorrow, and so we pray that will be successful. Uh, Drew and Jack Suttles are going to be going on a mission trip this month to South America. Keep them in your prayers. Uh, also, uh, Jewel Metter's wife, Joy Metter's, uh, her cancer has returned. Jewel is the preacher out at Resaca, and so keep Joy in your prayers. Uh, Brian and Jack are homesick with a virus, and Brian has strep too. Uh, so is Michael Bunch, homesick with a virus, and so keep him in your prayers. I learned this morning that Travis Gunnels has been in the hospital this morning battling kidney stones, and so keep uh, Travis in your prayers. And I have a note here from Danny and Renee that a 15-year-old girl, Lee Pendleton, who is a friend of their grandchildren, has recently been diagnosed with leukemia. She's in South Carolina. We want to pray for her that uh, they'll be able to treat that appropriately, and she'll bounce back quickly after that. Uh, let's see. A couple of other things. Uh, one note here. Uh, for the kids participating in Lads to Leaders Good Samaritan Project, we, we need to meet for just a minute after the uh, closing prayer today. Just come up front uh, for a service project. Uh, also, what a wonderful singing we had on Tuesday night. Uh, yeah. Nearly 200 people here in the building singing out. Uh, we sang for two hours, and then we went to the pavilion and sang some more, had ice cream and snacks. And then had a great fireworks show and a lot of hard work went into that singing. We appreciate uh, everybody who worked so diligently. By the way, uh, not only is that on our Facebook page, but it's also on our YouTube page. If you search Adairsville Church of Christ on YouTube, our channel will come up and all the sermons and special events that we have are posted up on YouTube as well. Uh, let's see. Be sure to be here on Tuesday night at 7 uh, muscle memory made me write Wednesday night at 7 in the newsletter, but it's actually Tuesday night for our Tuesday summer series. We're going to be having Tuesday night services all summer, or actually uh, <coughs> July, August, and the first part of September. We'll be having Tuesday night services instead of Wednesday night. And so come out and join in as we study the fruits of the Spirit. Brother Derek Brown is going to lead off our list of speakers talking about the subject of love. And so that's very needed in our world. Come out Tuesday night at 7 uh, and support that Tuesday summer series. Uh, I've got a note in the bulletin that says let's all be diligent to uh, do the work of God here in Adairsville. Lots of ways to become involved. Uh, if you're not doing as much as you would like to be, talk to one of the deacons or one of the elders. Uh, or me, I can help you get pointed in the right direction. Or if you have some good ideas about things we need to be doing and aren't, uh, talk to the uh, Talk to the elders, and they'll be happy to hear uh, what you have to say. I think maybe that's everything that I have right now on my list, at least. If you have other things you'd like to have announced, if you'll let me know, we'll be glad to do that at the appropriate time. Uh, but now we'll turn it over to our song leader. Number 684. 684. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be glad. Oh, 
Our scripture reading this morning will be from 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. 1 Samuel 9, 1 and 2. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekrath, the son of Aphaiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome <coughs> person than he among the children of, of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any other of the people, any of the other people. Let us pray. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, our Almighty God, the only God, the most holy Father, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you on this first day of the week, just as you commanded the early church to worship. We too are following your plan, Father. We thank you for each and every soul that has come this way this morning and for everyone that is worshiping with us online. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the church. We thank you for all the brethren. We thank you for precious Jesus. Father, this at this time, at this assembly, we ask a special blessing upon those that are sick. We're thankful that Joy Thacker and <coughs> Steve Hayes are back with us. We pray that you'll continue to strengthen them in the struggles of their illness. Please be with them. Be with Brian, and Jack, and Michael. Father, we pray that you'll be with Miss Sarah Medlock Ray as he waits upon her. Be with Sonny Parker and Lynn and their family. Be with Sandy and Joe and Cindy. Father, we, we pray that you be with Virgil and Patricia. Father, we pray that you'll be with DeMar Elam as he tries to recover from his injury. Father, we know that there are many more, many more. We pray for Valerie McCoy as she continues to get stronger. Father, there uh, is host of sick. We pray for those who are sad through the loss of loved ones. We pray for the unlovely, those that are destitute and without food and clothes, shelter, proper medical care. We pray for all our first responders, our nurses and doctors, those in the medical field. We pray for the Hides. Miss Diane's mom and dad. Father, we just have so many. So many. We pray for Jackie's sister Bonnie and her surgery tomorrow. <coughs> we pray for that family as they gather around her. We pray that surgery will be a success. 
and she can go about her normal life. Father, you are the Almighty God. You sent us your Son. You sent us your Word through Him. Father, we, we are so thankful that you loved us so much. We pray that in our summer series, Father, that we will share that fruit of the Spirit that we learn about in these nine consecutive weeks that we will learn how to serve you better and how to share that fruit with others and how to apply it to our lives. We pray that you'll be with each speaker that comes. Father, please be with us as we worship you. Be with Brother Rick, Mary, and Timothy. And please be with Mark and Anna in their new ministry in Monroe, Tennessee. So important. So important. We pray for all those in the Philippines and Emmanuel George and Mona Lee and India. And Father, we're so proud to learn that she was recently baptized into Christ. What a helpmate for Emmanuel that will be. Please be with us as we worship. Give us strength through your word. May we look in the mirror of your word and, and do an inventory of our lives and be with Rick as he teaches us. And be with us as we continue to worship. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.
he's not a member of the New Testament church, and, and the subject of the Lord's Supper came up, and we looked in Acts chapter 20 about how they met on the first day of the week to partake the Lord's Supper, and, and this man said that partaking of the Lord's Supper every week is too often. He said it loses its meaning. It's the first time I've ever heard anyone say that to me, and we know it not to be true, but to be honest, I wasn't prepared for that response from him. So I, I am now prepared, and I've brought a reason why, uh, a list of reasons why we should partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. And I would like to share some of those reasons with you. First, it takes us back to the cross. In Matthew chapter 26, through verses 28, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, and he said that the bread was for his body and that the fruit of the vine was for his blood. And, and partaking of the Lord's Supper reminds us of that sacrifice. It reminds us of the, the stripes that he took for our sake, and it reminds us of all of his sufferings that, that he took our place for. Second, it reminds us of God's love towards us. John chapter 3 verse 16 said, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. I'd like to read to you out of Romans chapter 5 verse 7 and 8. It says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commandeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it reminds us of God's love that he commands towards us. Because it reminds us of his love, it also reminds us to love and obey Jesus. 1 John 4.19 says that we love him because he first loved us. And I'd like to point out that love is not a feeling, it's an action. And John 14.15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And finally, Acts 27, the passage that we read, says that they met together on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper. That's what the early church did, and as I've heard many good preachers say, if we do what they did, we'll be what they were. And what they were were, for, were the Christians, the members of the body of the Christ, belonging to the church of Christ that he purchased with his blood to become his bride that he's gone to prepare a place for. Paul said, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ, in 1 Corinthians 11. 1. So we should partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday, just like the first century church did, so that we can be just what the first century church was. Bow with me, please, and let's thank God for the opportunity that we have for the, to partake of this. Dear most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that we we live in this country where we can come together and we can worship you. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son. We thank you for the opportunity to learn about your word, to bring us closer to you. And we pray that as we worship you, that it's pleasing in your eyes. We thank you again for your son. It's in his most holy and precious name that we pray. Father, we come before you again. We thank you for the blood that was shed on our behalf, the sacrifice that was made so that we wouldn't have to. We thank you for sending your Son to teach us about you, to bring us to you, to bridge that gap that we were unable to. We pray that as we go through this life that each and every day that we can draw closer to you and be more pleasing in your eyes. Thank you for your Son, in Christ's holy name. just a moment ago, if we do what they did, we'll be what they were, and that they were Christians, followers of Christ. Something else the early church did was they gave of their means on the first day of the week. 
And I want to read to you also out of Philippians chapter 4, verse 17. It says, Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. We have a wonderful opportunity this morning to participate in ministries even around the world. Not very long ago, we heard from a man who spoke to us about the work that's going on in the Philippines. The elders here do a wonderful job, and God's given them the authority to, to decide what is done with the monies that are given here this morning. But through our contribution, we're able to partake in the fruits that are done even all around the world, in India and in the Philippines, right here in Adairsville, Georgia. And uh, that's, that's a great opportunity for us. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you. We pray that our service is pleasing in your eyes. We pray that, that our contribution may be used in a meaningful way that would spread your word and spread your gospel and bring others to know you. We pray that the elders here at this congregation would always look to you and to your word to better decide how to spend such money. We pray that you be with us always. In Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. And there's a basket at the rear, at the back of the auditorium. If you would, Mark, eight hundred eighty-one. Eight hundred eighty-one will be the song after the lesson. Before the lesson, 732. 732. Let's all stand while we sing. 
and look at some lessons that we can learn from his life. You know, the background of King Saul is found in 1 Samuel chapter 8. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, the children of, uh, the children of Israel decided that they didn't want God as their king anymore. Instead, they wanted a king like the nations around them. Uh, verse, number, uh, verse number 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 8 says, Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And God basically said to Samuel, uh, Don't you grieve over this. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. And so uh, Samuel, uh, the Bible says, heard all the words of the people and rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, verse 22, Hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. And so he tried to warn them. He said in this, uh, in this very context, he said, You're going to have to pay higher taxes and the king's going to send your boys off to war and your daughters are going to become servants in the palace and all these problems that you're going to have if you get yourself an earthly king instead of following your heavenly king. And they said, we don't care. We want to be like the nations around us. We want to have a man on a fancy throne with a golden palace. And we want to fit in and be just like everybody else. That's a problem for God's people. God's people never want his, his people to fit in with the world. He wants us to stand out and be different. But they decided they wanted a king. And so God gave them a king. And... He was a very impressive king at first. Uh, we saw the passage that was read in our, in our hearing a few minutes ago. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. The Bible tells us about, uh, about Saul's uh, father, Kish. And the Bible says of his son, uh, his name was Saul. He was, the King James says, a choice young man and goodly. In other words, he was a fine-looking specimen. He was a handsome fellow and stood head and shoulders taller than the rest of his kin, kinsmen in Israel. And so he cut a striking figure then. When people looked at him, they thought, man, that's the kind of king we need right there. Look, big, tall, strong, handsome fellow. That, that's got to be exactly what God wants uh, for us. And so the first thing we can learn about the life of Saul is he had a good start as king. He had a great beginning. In uh, chapter 10, verse number 1, and by the way, most of this sermon is going to come out of the book of 1 Samuel today. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse number 1, the Bible says, Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, uh, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? And so it is true that that uh, Saul was chosen by God. Saul was chosen by God. And so that's a wonderful way to start out. But God choosing you to be, a, uh, he says here, a captain over his inheritance or a king over his people. Uh, he was chosen by God. And also, the Bible says in this very chapter that he was filled with God's spirit. 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse number 10 uh, it says that Saul, that uh, Saul, uh, met up with some prophets there, and it says, uh, Behold, when they came uh, came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And so now, here is Saul receiving the Spirit of God and being able to prophesy along with these prophets that he met up. And so another indication that God was with him, that God was on his side. God chose him, and God filled him with his spirit. And initially, uh, Saul was very humble. Verse 22 of chapter 10 says, Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should come hither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. And so this is when they were looking for uh, Saul to anoint him king, and they couldn't find anywhere. It couldn't find him anywhere. It's because he was nervous and worried and didn't think he could be the man that God wanted to be. And so he was hiding when they were trying to anoint him. It shows his humility, doesn't it? And so Saul was humble, at least when he started out. And so 
You know, we need a good beginning too, don't we? But what we don't need to do is just depend upon how we get started. Saul got started in a good way, but it's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. And even though Saul had a good start, he didn't have a very good finish uh, of, his, uh, of his monarchy. He didn't live a very godly life. He let things distract him. And so even if we start good, we've got to stay on course, don't we? Most of us learn the gospel from a loved one, from somebody who thinks enough of our soul to teach us the gospel. And we have soft, good hearts that make us listen to the word and become obedient to it. But that's only the beginning. Obeying the gospel is only the beginning. Too many people view obedience to the gospel as having your ticket punched to heaven. And there's nothing else that you have to worry about, nothing else that you have to do, when really nothing could be further from the truth. Obeying the gospel is just the door into the kingdom. And once you get into the kingdom, you've got to live the rest of your life working for God and being faithful. You can't let the devil distract you or get you, uh, get you off track. As Revelation 2 verse 10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. And so once we get started, that's great. But we've got to keep on going to the end. And that's something that Saul lost sight of. Because point number two, if we look at the life of Saul, we learn about the danger of disobedience. The danger of disobedience. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 13. This is when... Uh, uh, this is when Saul decided that he needed to make a, a sacrifice. Saul said, uh, of course, you know, under the Old Testament system, that it was the priests who were authorized by God to burn sacrifices unto God. They were the go-between, between, between the regular people and God. And any Israelite who wanted to worship God under the Old Testament system had to bring their offering to the priest. And the priest would then sacrifice that animal on behalf of that person to God. But Saul tried to go around the he tried to go around God's rules. And the Bible says in verse number nine of chapter thirteen, and Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and a peace offering and peace offerings. And he burnt the offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, the whole Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? It's a good question, isn't it? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore I said, uh, Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. That was the beginning of Saul's downfall right there. He took upon himself that which God had not authorized. He disobeyed and he thought, well, nobody else is here to do it. I'll just make these burnt offerings myself. God doesn't accept that. You can't just decide that things aren't going your way and so you'll put God on the back burner and do whatever you want to do. That was a failure for Saul and it's a failure for every one of us. Now, I'm thankful that today, under the Christian dispensation, God has made us all priests and priestesses in his service. And so we don't have to seek out some kind of earthly high priest or earthly priesthood to make sacrifices on our behalf. We can go right to the Father through Jesus and make our own sacrifices and worship God acceptably in that way. And I'm thankful that's the case. But when God gives a law, you've got to live by it. It doesn't matter if you're the king or you're the uh, doorman of the palace. It doesn't matter if you're at the top of the heap or you're a, a, you know, a, a lowly wash, wash girl in the, in the castle. None of that matters. What matters is you've got to do what God says to do. And Saul lost track of that. The next thing happened in Saul in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. 
1 Samuel chapter 15, the Bible tells about the children of Israel that were supposed to go and destroy uh, the Amalekites. And God was told that they were uh, to go down and smite them. And verse number 9 says, But Saul and the people spared Agag, the king, and the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatling, uh, fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried to the Lord all night. You know, it was a very simple instruction that God had given to Saul and, and the army. That was, you go down to Amalek and you destroy them all. Because the time of their judgment was full. They had disobeyed God. They had made themselves his enemies. And God used Saul and his armies, the armies of Israel, as a tool to destroy the Amalekites. And so, the, very, the instruction was very simple. You destroy them all. Verse 3 says, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man, woman, infant, suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and ass. In other words, everybody goes. Now that's terrible, harsh judgment. But God knows what he's doing. And it wasn't too hard for Saul to understand. And he went down there, and instead of doing what God said, he said, you know what, I think I'll bring back Agag. I'll bring back the king and show him off and show everybody this trophy of how we destroyed Amalek. Uh, Amalek. And I'll bring those, uh, all those animals home, and we'll take the choicest of the animals, and uh, we'll use them for our own purposes. Well, God's not, God's not pleased with that. It says that... Samuel rose early in the morning uh, to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, set him up a place, and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed uh, be of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Well, that's a lie, wasn't it? Saul came to Samuel and said, I did exactly what God told me to do. Samuel said, verse 14, What meaneth in the bleeding of sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Isn't that amazing? Saul said, I did what God said, and right about that time, the animals started kicking up a fuss. Wait a minute. God said, destroy them all. What are you doing here with the spoils of war when God said, destroy them all? And Samuel said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Well, that wasn't true either, was it? Because they had the king. They had Agag. But notice how Saul said, What my fault? They did it. You mean the people that you rule over? You told them not to and they did it anyway? <coughs> no, it was Saul that did this. Saul was the one who bore the responsibility. He was the one who should have been accountable to God and did exactly what God told him to do. And then he tried to set, tell Samuel that he had when he knew he had it. See, God's instruction is clear. And when God makes his instructions clear, it's not, not up to man to put that on the back burner. It's not up to man to decide, <coughs> oh, you know what, that would be wasteful, wouldn't it? That'd be wasteful to uh, to destroy all these sheep and all these animals. We'd go back and sacrifice them to God. God didn't want them to sacrifice us. He wanted them destroyed. And he made that perfectly clear to King Saul. And so the danger of disobedience, what happens uh, when that is the case? Well, you're going to you're gonna have to pay the price. And that's exactly what happened here with, with Saul. He had to pay the price. And so the danger of disobedience, uh, there was a consequence for this. Uh, look down at verse number 26. Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold on the skirt of his mantle and rent it. 
And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to, the, to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Of course, that was talking about David. We already noticed a man after God's own heart was going to take his, his, uh, his throne. And this is talking about David here. And so again, <laughs> he's told, because of your disobedience, the kingdom is going to be taken away from you and given to another. There are always consequences for disobedience to God. Now, we might not have a throne to lose, but we got something to lose. We've got a soul. We've got something that's more precious than the power of sitting on a throne. And that is our, our eternal souls are in the balance. And Saul had to learn the hard way that you've got to do what God says to do. You know, that led him down a downward spiral. When God sentenced him and told him because of your disobedience, your kingdom is going to be taken from you and given to another, it sent him on a journey of uh, jealousy and pride. And there's an important lesson there when we look at the life of Saul too. 1 Samuel 16 and verse number 14. The Bible says that uh, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Uh, and so he sacrificed that which the blessings of the Lord by his own disobedience. And so then the Spirit of the Lord left him. And what happened then? Uh, well, he decided to try to kill David. He was jealous of David. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse number 9. Uh, 8 and 9 talks about uh, how jealous he was of David. Uh, and then in chapter 19, uh, verses 9 and 10, following that, uh, that jealousy, the Bible says an evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul. He sat in the house with his javelin in his hand, his spear, and David played with his hand, and, saw, and Saul sought to smite David. Uh, even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall. David fled and escaped that night. So imagine, here's the king and David who loves the king and because of the king's furious, uh, uh, fury and jealousy, he takes his spear and tries to kill David with it. David just slips out of the way and the spear's uh, stuck in the wall over there and David gets away with his life. But what does it take for a man to be so jealous and, and angry that he tries to kill an innocent, an Ill, innocent man? Well, that's what happened to Saul. That uh, that's, comes from that dangerous, uh, rash decision making. That's what happens when you leave behind God and you stop letting God make decisions for you and you start making it start making your decisions on your own, they start to be the wrong decisions. And Saul did that in his life as well. Uh, in, uh, in chapter 14, chapter 14, verse number 24, uh, the Bible said, uh, the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening that I may be avenged on my enemies so none of the people tasted any of the food. And they came to the land of a wood and there was honey upon the ground and the people were coming to the wood. Behold, the, the honey dropped, but no man put his hand to his mouth for the people feared the oath. So that that's especially shows how foolish you are when you tell your soldiers don't eat any food because I, I want everybody to be serious about this battle. Well, soldiers need food. And so you start making these bad decisions, rash decision makings, when you depend upon your own feelings instead of depending upon the Lord. And so what happens uh, when you uh, disobey God and you're filled with pride and jealousy? Well, uh, as has been said already, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. <coughs> and in 1 Samuel chapter 28, we, we really see how bad it gets. 1 Samuel chapter 28. Uh, look, at this, uh, look at this passage here. It says, uh, this is when the Philistines came against the Israelites. They gathered themselves together, verse number 4 says. Verse number 5 says, when Saul, 
saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. Now he wants to talk to God again. After rejecting God and rejecting God's way and trying to kill God's man, now when the Philistines come to try to fight against Israel, he says, you know what, I realize I need God now. And God wasn't talking to him yet. Uh, yeah, because the Bible says in verse 6, When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by the prophets. And so he had a method where he could go through the priest to talk to God, but God wasn't interested. He wasn't speaking to the king in dreams or in visions, nor by the prophets. And so Saul said, well, I'm going to get a word from God one way or the other. Then Saul said unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said unto him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Now he's turned to witchcraft. Uh, most people think that this idea of a familiar spirit had to do with a, a demon possession. And so... Basically what Saul said, if God won't talk to me, I'm going to get some supernatural help one way or the other. And he turned to the witch at Endor. The Bible says that Saul disguised himself and went and put on other raiment. Can you imagine? Here's this tall king that stands out among the crowd and now he's all hunched over with a hood over. Uh, you know, making sure nobody knows who he is. And he goes to the witch at Endor by night. And he says, I pray thee, divine unto me by thy familiar spirit and bring him up uh, bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee in other words I want to talk to somebody who's already died and the woman said unto him behold thou knowest what Saul hath done how he cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land wherefore layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die she knew what what this fellow was asking her to do was wrong but she did it anyway Saul swear to her by the Lord saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. But then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And so she finally says, Okay, uh, you're giving me your word that nothing bad's going to happen, so who do you want to talk to? And Saul says, Bring me up Samuel. Well, let me tell you something. This lady had no power to bring up Samuel. She didn't have the power to raise the dead. This demon, if, if it be a demon that possessed her, had no power to raise the dead. You know how I know? Because the next verse says, When the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. She was surprised as anybody that Samuel came up and spoke. That she got this vision of Samuel uh, being raised from the dead. She had no power to do that. And uh, when that happened, she knew that that must be God working. And it must be uh, because... This man was actually Saul, the king. The king said unto her, be, be not afraid, for what sawest thou? The woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man covered up, and he's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me. And God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. God won't listen. Nobody will listen. And so I came to this witch to see if I could get a word from you. It was God that sent Samuel back to give Saul a warning. And Samuel said... The Lord hath uh, said, then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and it is become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thy hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, because thou hast, uh, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel. Uh, with thee into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow thou and thy sons shall be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. And so God sent Samuel back to say, not only are you going to lose the kingdom, but you're going to lose your life. 
And tomorrow at this time, your sons, you and your sons will be with me on the other side. You'll be dead, in other words. And so here is Saul so desperate to get a message from God that he turns to a witch. And when God sends Samuel this message, it's, he says, it's not going to go the way you want it to go. You're going to pay with your life for your disobedience. So the tragic end of Saul is recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 31. And that is the Philistines were fighting against Israel. And uh, an archer drew, a, uh, drew his bow back and let an arrow go. And it hit Saul. And he went down sore. Uh, he was sore wounded of the archers. And the Saul said unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest uh, these uncircumcised come and th thrust me through and abuse me. But the armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore tall, Saul took his sword and fell upon it. And so he was grievously injured in battle and then fell on his own sword. Now what do we learn from this? Well, one thing we learn is that obedience is better than sacrifice. 1 Samuel 15, verse number 22, Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rains. Saul took it upon himself to make these burnt offerings and God says it's way more important to obey God than it is to make these, uh, to make these offerings and sacrifices. God's concerned about us doing what's right. There's a lot of people out, th out there in this world thinking that they're sacrificing for God, thinking that they're working for God and doing all these things for God, but like, uh, like Saul, they're doing things completely uh, not in accordance with the Word of God. And so to obey is better than sacrifice. We also learn the importance of Saul for, of humility. Saul was lifted up with pride. And Proverbs 16 and verse number 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. And then we need to trust in God and not trust in ourselves and our own power. Amen. That's something that Saul definitely tried to do. But Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thy, thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And so we can't depend upon our own, our own desires, our own will. We have to depend upon God. When we think we got it all figured out, if we're trying, it, trying to do that without God, it's going to lead to destruction. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I guess if there was ever a person who thought that he had it made, it was probably young King Saul tall and handsome and strong and striking and it looked like everything was going his way. But when you turn your back on God, destruction is not far behind. And that's what Saul found out the hard way. Let's be faithful to God no matter what. I'm glad we can learn from the life of Saul and men like him. We can learn from his successes but also from his failures so we don't repeat those things. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, obey the gospel before it's too late. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. If we can help you do that today, we want to. And if you hear as a Christian, you realize maybe you haven't been as faithful to God as you should. Maybe you drifted away, stepped out of the footsteps of Jesus. It's time to come back through repentance and prayer. And if we can pray with you and for you, we'd be glad to do that. Don't leave here in a lost condition. Let us help you if we can. As together we stand and as we sing. There is a God.
Brother Tyler has responded to the gospel call today. Uh, he said it sounded like that sermon was aimed right at him. That, you know what? That's what people with soft hearts always think. And we're thankful that he responded in this way. Uh, he uh, has uh, turned his back on the church uh, for a while and realizes what a mistake that is. He wants to come back to the Lord and back to faithfulness. Uh, he, like uh, most of us, maybe all of us at times, struggle with pride and needs more humility. And the world has a way of humbling us, doesn't it? And I'm thankful that he's come forward here with, uh, with a soft heart, responding to the gospel in repentance, and wants to do better. And aren't you glad that we serve a God that gives us another chance? You know, we all need second chances, don't we? I need it the third, and fourth, and fifth, all right down the line. And I'm thankful that uh, God is, loves us enough to forgive us and wipe our slate clean. And when we repent and come to him with, uh, with a contrite heart, then he takes care of us. And I'm so thankful that, uh, that Tyler has come forward like this today and wants to get his life right. And I appreciate his, uh, his conviction in doing so. Let's go to uh, God in prayer on his behalf. And let's be uh, good encouragement to Tyler uh, and really to all who are striving to do better in their spiritual lives as well. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful of the need for this good soft heart of this, uh, this strong man. We pray, Father, for Tyler and uh, for his family. We pray that you bless him. Most of all, forgive him of his sins. Help him, Father, to, to have more humility and less pride and to lean more upon thee and upon thy word. Father, we're thankful that he wants to come back to the church and back to thee. We're thankful, Father, for thy loving forgiveness for the sins that we commit. Father, we're grateful that we can continually be washed clean in the blood of Jesus. We're thankful for that blood that was shed there for us on the cross. And we realize that without that shedding of blood, without uh, the sacrifice of Jesus, there'd be no hope for any of us. Father, we pray for Tyler going forward that he will uh, make good decisions, that he will resist the temptations that the old devil puts in front of him. Uh, he'll be a good leader in his home and uh, he will make the kind of choices that will help be a good example to all those around him. And we pray, Father, that we will do all that we can to encourage him to do right, to make good decisions, and to uh, be a great leader in his family. Uh, Father, be with us all and help us to learn from his good example. Take so much courage to come forward in a crowd like this and to confess your own sins. But, Father, we know that by doing so, he can not only get forgiveness, but also the uh, the prayers of everybody here, the encouragement and the love uh, from everybody here, Father, and we pray that we would all learn a great lesson from that. Father, be with us and bless us and help us to uh, continue to live in a way that will be well pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' holy name, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Well, it's been a great morning, Kevin. It's been a great, yes. been a great morning already. We're thankful so much for your presence. Uh, don't forget, uh, kids that are doing uh, Last to Leaders, and especially uh, Good Samaritan, you around Good Samaritan, after the closing prayer, just come up to the front just a minute about uh, uh, a project that needs to be done this week, and uh, uh, won't take very long. Uh, that's all I've got. Anything else need to be announced? Thank you again for visiting with us here. If you're visiting, we want you to know how much we appreciate our visitors, and I uh, love and appreciate each one of you. If that's all there is, if you'll stand, we'll be dismissed now with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day, for the weather, for the rain, for the rain, and for what we, we can use a little bit more. Father, we've got great lessons today. We hope that we can, we can learn from these and apply these in our daily lives. Uh, Father, as we come back tonight to learn more about you, 